the gift being here with y'all.
Joshua Heschel said, the earth is filled with the glory of God. Humanity creates routine, life becomes routine, and routine is resistance to wonder, to glory. So Lord, open our eyes this weekend even more, even greater broader, open my eyes. Mm -hmm. Every table is an altar. Every breath is a gift. From you, every moment is a treasure, every day is a kiss from you, God. Every table is a note.
You're worthy of our lives, now and forever, God. Where do we go from there? What should we even... Mm. 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 Let us sing the song of Jesus. Let us sing the song of Him. What we sung in the beginning, we'll be singing in the end. Let us sing the song of Jesus. There is hope in the For we all have left the garden and we'll all return again. Sing it again. Let us sing the song of Jesus. Let us sing the song of Him. What we sung in the beginning, we'll be singing in. Let us sing the song of Jesus. There is hope in the refrain. For we all have left the garden and we'll all return again. Let us sing the song of Jesus. Let us sing the song.
sing the song of Jesus. Let us sing the song of Jesus. It's a song that calls us by our name. A song that leads us home again. And there is no greater love than this. Let us sing the song of Jesus. Let us sing the song of Jesus. And let us sing the song of Jesus. It's a song that we sing the song of Jesus mm. let us sing the song of Jesus is a song that calls by our name a song Let us sing the song of Jesus. Amen. Let's begin to thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your presence.
for the praise to the world of my future all depends upon I'm trusting you I am trusting you I am trusting you trusting you. I am trusting you. I am trusting you, my God. Because you know me by my name. Every empire knows us by number. But the Lamb of God knows us by our name. Just put your hands up like this. I'm trusting you. Just tell them, I'm trusting you, my God. We're trusting you. We're trusting you. Yeah, I am trusting you. I am trusting you, my God. Just a few thoughts, and then we'll go back in. I've been the blind man on the road, <laughs> right? 
I've been the blind man on the road. I've been the boy running back home. I've been the sinner and the saint, and the love of God has never changed. I've been the blind man on the road. I remember one night reading that passage and asking Jesus, Jesus, why did you ask blind man Barnabas what you could do for him? Isn't it obvious? He's been blind since he was born. Just in my thought, I would never usually speak like that to Jesus, honestly. I don't recommend it. But I asked Jesus, I said, Jesus, why would you, why would you ask him what you could do for him? I really want to know because I know there must be something under the surface, something deeper there that I don't understand because you asked him. You could have just healed him. Well, Jesus didn't feel the need to answer me right away. So I asked him, I remember I was at a retreat and I asked him about seven o'clock that night and I went to sleep and I woke at 3 a.m to like the wind of the spirit kind of just give me the answer. And it was one of those moments where I could get up and write it down or I could forget it. Have you ever had those moments where just something revelation comes and you can either get up from your bed or you can go back to sleep. You can get up and write it down, but you know if you don't, you won't remember it. It's that kind of thing. Like when you get stuff in dreams, right? And it just, it came over me because I don't want to just fix you, I want to know you. This is the beauty of Jesus. Sometimes we just want, just fix us. Jesus asks us, each of us tonight, what can I do for you? Do you know that Jesus is present in this room tonight as we worship him, asking us the question, what can I do for you? can I do for you? And I, I would think that that's an easy answer for me to come up with. Well, you know, you can. but if you allow yourself, it might not even be in this moment of worship tonight. It may be when you get home and you're by your bed, kneel down by your bed like you did when you were a little kid, fold your hands and allow the spirit of God to ask you that question. What can I do for you? I've been the blind man on the road. Lord, awaken us to your glory. Awaken us to your presence in Jesus' name. Awaken us to the God who knows us by our name in Jesus' name. He doesn't want to just fix you. He wants to know you. sing a song over you. You can be seated for a second and we'll go back in. Um, but take a moment. This idea of the glory of God. I remember I was I was uh, on my way to the Isle of Wight reading the story of a young lady named Eddie Healison. She uh, didn't get as popular as uh, Anne Frank. You know, she was a little older, maybe in her early 20s. 
when she went to Vesterbork, a holding camp for Jews, and she was a non-religious Jewish girl. And she found herself at Vesterbork, and while she was there, she began experiencing God to such to such an overwhelming level that she realized that somebody's got to write down all these encounters of people, you know what I mean? I've got to write down, she, she's known for writing this, she said, somebody's got to write all these experiences down so that people will know in the future that God lived even in these times. I was reading this story in 2008 in the U.S. that economy was collapsing. People were terrified and frightened. Here's a woman that finds the very presence of Jesus in the midst of that camp to such a degree that she would begin to see God, Jesus standing next to her captors and she would begin to have compassion on the young soldiers. Pray for them. Somebody's got to write these experiences down so the people will know in the future that God lived even in these times. I thought, wow. Markets collapse and we're, and we're losing our faith. This girl finds her faith in a concentration camp. You see, this is what was happening to me. Then I'm reading the scriptures one day and I, I see, I'm reading the passage where Jesus is on the boat sleeping and the disciples are terrified and the winds and the waves are crashing over the boat. And they're terrified and they are upset with Jesus because Jesus is sleeping, which I don't even know how Jesus was sleeping. It's almost comedy to me, but he's sleeping on the boat while the winds and the waves are tearing over the boat and they think they're going to die and he gets up and wakes up and tells them you have a little faith and then he calms the wind and the waves I don't know why was it maybe it was because what I was reading about Eddie or something but all of a sudden I saw the parallel passage to that just inverted it's like almost the same exact scenario and story it's just inverted Gethsemane didn't read it in a book or anything it's just as I'm reading it I see Gethsemane and I see this is the same exact thing it's just inverted Jesus is awake to eternity to wind and waves of a different kind and the disciples can't stay up for it to be a prophetic people is to be awake to what Jesus is awake to and asleep to what he's asleep to. Maybe to say it this way. Right. When Jesus is awake, be awake. And when Jesus is asleep, take a nap. I always love the news. Ooh, I love the news. So I love a good argument. My mind works that way. I like it. And I think you should be informed, but I, I find that Jesus is often asleep to the news, to the politics, to the systems of this world that in the end don't really care for your name. Empires have never cared for your name. They're not designed to care for the name. You are designed by a living God who knows you by your name, who cares for you by name. And, uh, I think it's a misinterpretation of the scripture that God needs a book to remember you. 
That's what the Native Americans had trouble with. The Native Americans that followed Jesus. Boy, white men, they sure think paper has a lot of importance. <laughs> They'd say, wow. They carry a tissue around in their pocket, and blow their snot into it. It's for fear that they might lose something of value. <laughs> <laughs> they tell us that God has a big book and he writes all of our names in it as if he can't remember. God knows you by your name. And um, he cares for you. So I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you, my God. So, I wrote this little song, it just says, we lost our bass player. Mm. Let me sing another different song over you then. We'll wait for him. Like an unborn baby in a mother's womb. Before my lungs could breathe, I was alive in you. Before my eyes were Before my tongue could speak, before the bond was broken between you and me, you were home to me. You are and kind you are peace peace to me you are never failing see you are home home to me patient you are patient
are coming home So let our eyes be filled with wonder Let our lives be filled with song Let the way of Jesus lead us back where we belong Listen in You are where we all have come from. You are where to that song in just a second. Just let me do one more. Mm -hmm. Put up the lyrics for Wild and Free. It's a holy thing to be wild and free Like a raging storm on the calm Lord, hear my heart until my heart believes It's the only thing to be wild and free Yes, it is It's a sacred space to be lost in world to safely rest in the mystery. Lord, I feel my heart until it's full of home. It's all. Our God is wild Our God is full of mystery Our God is freedom Our God is full of destiny His love has borders That I will never reach It's a holy thing It's a holy thing To be wild shaped and formed by the hand of God no eye no death could ever see 
separate us. The greater the distance, the greater the love. It's all. It's the only thing to be wild and free is love as borders that are will never reach. It's the only thing to be wild and free. It's the only thing to be wild. It's like a Nazarite. It's like a Nazarite. Y'all know a Nazarite where it's wild and free? You understand that? I'll leave that one on you. Let you let you mull it. Our friend Caleb is here with his flags. heard about us coming and, and just said, I want to come, and, and honestly came at his own expense to be with us. We're going to bless him in some way. You, you want to visit him out there at the table and, and, and be a blessing to him. Uh, Steve Williams is going to come. We're going to receive an offering, so would you get ready for an offering, church? You know how to do that. I'm glad to tell you that we speak not in... in uh, like Paul says, I'm not speaking to you from lack tonight. I'm not speaking to you because of that. All the needs that we have are met. Can you, can you give thanks to that? Yeah. What we need has been met. We're receiving an offering because we have special guests and we have a special event and, and we want to bless them. So Steve's going to talk to you. My friend. Alan always asked me to do the religious thing, <laughs> take an offering. Psalms 110 says this, David, when he was king, was actually prophesying about the resurrected Jesus in his kingdom. And he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand 
till I make your enemies your footstool. Everybody wants to know what Jesus is doing today. I want to tell you what he's doing. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father with a smile on his face, looking down at his enemies. That's what he's doing. He's not chewing his nails and he's not worried. Then it says, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. And Zion is, scripture, is not a place. It's a people. It's the people of God. It's new covenant people. The Lord shall send the rod of strength. The place of authority is to come out of new covenant people. We say, God, it's all yours. No, he said, I gave it to you. That we now have this, this place where his strength comes from. And it says here, rule in the middle of your enemies. Does anybody have any enemies that are around you that are trying to make noise and get your attention? This is what, this is what the Bible says. You rule in the middle of those things. They don't rule us. We rule over them. And then I love this verse right here. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Another translation says your people will be willing volunteers in the day of your power. Do you know how you can tell when God is really at work at, with people? This is how you can tell. They're not begging for somebody to go work with children because God's people are willing volunteers in the day of his power. They're not begging for people to be great ushers and great greeters and great prayers and great servants because, listen, if God's power has touched us, then we become like him and he is generous. If there's anything you will learn about God, he's generous. He's very generous very, very generous. And when we get touched by him and his power touches us, then we say, God, here I am. What do you want? And we always say that about money. Christians, they all say this. Well, it all belongs to the Lord. We say that until he asks for some of it. And then we kind of swallow. Some of us say, oh me, and some say, okay. But listen, you can say you've been touched by God when you start getting generous with your money and investing it into the kingdom. Everybody said? Amen. Amen? How many have been touched by God? Amen. Lord, I pray right now over this great church. I pray that you will bless them, that you will prosper them, that this church will actually fill this city with willing volunteers because they've been touched by the power of God. Lord, let a spirit of generosity that exceeds what's already here come upon this house and let them become a generous people because the power of God has touched their lives. Lord, bless this offering. Lord, do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Holy Spirit, right now, you talk to people and tell them what to give. Lord, bless this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what we want you to do. If you need, a, if you need an offering envelope, would you lift your hands? We'll, we'll get an offering envelope to you. Before we, before we push the buckets, let's give the envelopes. Raise your hand if you need an envelope. Because if you need a record, if you don't need a record, you won't need an envelope. But if you do, we want you to have it. We want you to have it. All right, let's let's uh, let's go ahead and pass the pass these buckets. Thank you very much for your generosity. This makes all the difference. It makes us able to do these kind of events. Then as soon as the offering is over, as, as Jason said earlier, we're going to go back in. All right? How many of you know there's more tonight? 
There's more for us. We're going to go back in and get some more. You are good, Lord. You are so good. From the mountain to the valley, from the desert to the raging sea, in the silence of the city street, your presence always covers me. From the mountain, from the mountain.
Presence always covers me. Oh, your presence always covers me. Amen. Amen. Mm. It's a sacred space to be lost in wonder, to safely rest in mystery. Lord, fill my heart until it's full of love. It's a holy thing to be wise. So come on, everybody, oh, and come on, everyone, run like a river, oh, we follow the sun, with a heart set up, just as wide as the sea, it's a holy thing to be wise. It's a holy thing to be wild and free. Amen. I'm going to, you can be seated for a second. The great news about worship, what we receive, we receive pardon to be pardoned. When we sing songs of worship, we, we don't just sing them to, to create an expression that we have no activity in. The kind of worship that Jesus is after is the kind that leads us back to the activity. Those fingers go on forever, right? We, we had some dear friends come into town and stay with us the night uh, when Bethel came to Milwaukee and so the McClure's and my buddies, the Helsers were there and they came to visit us with their kids and our kids and so we went and the entire night we had our hands raised declaring who God is and then with the Helsers declaring who we are and then declaring over the city of Milwaukee and over the region and over pastors and over leaders declaring, 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 declaring. And there was so much declaring. I was crying and weeping and being moved and and we left, and this friend, this couple that we had, they have four kids. They got two. They're just 20, 25 years old, and they had two kids, and then they got pregnant, and now they, they had twins. So we were like, man, they need a, they need a worship night. <laughs> you know. So we figured out a way to get them sitters and brought them along, and they don't have a lot. And this buddy of mine, BJ, he, he went all over town searching for this record by this old Christian Englishman named Bill Fay. 
sort of an art guy, you know, that lives in England somewhere. I didn't even know he was a follower of Jesus. And uh, he went all over looking for town, and there was only one of these records in all, all over town. And he brought it as a gift because I brought him to this worship night. He brought it as a gift for me. He said, Jason, I looked all over town. There's only one of these. It's called Who is the Sender? you got to listen to it. So I, uh, I did. The next morning I got up and I had a little time. Helzers wanted to sleep in. So I, I sat down and I put on Who is the Sender? But it's vinyl, right? So you, gotta, like, it, you just get three songs at a time. And then you got to flip it, you know. And so I, I'm listening to this. And the first song got me. I had me. Because the first song, he starts off and he says, the geese are flying westward. I thought, wow. The geese are flying westward. I just immediately, from my mind, I thought, wow, who says the geese are flying westward? I always thought the geese, they were flying north and south or something. You know what I mean? The geese are flying westward. But the, the power of it was it started, the whole record starts with this beautiful observation. The geese are flying westward. I thought, wow. The power of, the uh, 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 reason that's powerful to me, I know, you, you, you know, poets kind of tend to focus on everything that nobody else cares about. But the geese are flying westward. Why that's powerful to me is because, see, immature poetry rhymes everything. Immature poetry, uh, like the great poets would teach you, a 101 class in poetry, they'd say, don't use metaphor, just write what you see. Just like the Revelation writer, right? Write what you see. Then you utilize the tools of metaphor and other things. But first, just write what you see. And, and it just hit me. The first thing this guy taking me on a journey says is, the geese are flying westward. The geese are going home. Maybe I should have traveled to places I didn't know. If you're listening to poetry much, you know he may not just be talking about Maybe I should have ventured to things I didn't know. He's talking about a lot more, right? The geese are flying westward. The geese are going home. So I'm in. And now I'm getting touched as much as I was the night before. But it's completely different. And I get to the third track. And he says, there's a melody somewhere deep. There's a melody at the heart of it, root and branch, flower and seed. There's a melody at the heart of it, and it's all so deep. It's all so deep. There's a melody at the heart of it. And he just keeps going on and on. I can't remember all the words. I probably already screwed him up, but it was powerful. And there I am, and I'm sitting in the chair, and I'm in. And then, it, and then it stops. So then I have to go flip it. So I flip it. I go through another three songs. Then I have to flip it, get out the other vinyl. It's very complicated. Get out the other vinyl. Put that on. I get to the seventh song. He says, a revelation came to me today. It just came right knocking at my front door. A melody came to my fingers. And I wonder, who is the sender? I'd really like to know. And then he just keeps going and going and going and going. And you get to the eighth and the ninth track, and he starts using words like Lord. And then the ninth or tenth track, he starts declaring the name Jesus. And by the end of the record, he's singing about the justice of the kingdom of God. And tears are falling down my cheeks, and I'm being moved. And I said, Lord, how, what's wrong with me? Because I know most of my worship friends would think I'm crazy, but this is as worshipful to me as last night, and last night was over the top. What is it about this that's as powerful? It's all powerful to me. And the Lord brought me back to 
that morning at 5.15 in the morning, Oliver, our seven-year-old, he didn't get to go the night before. He was kind of upset about that because he had school the next day. And <clears throat> so he comes jumping to our bed about 5.15 in the morning and stared at me, his eyes wide open, staring at me until I'd open my eyes. You know how they do that. Just waiting for me. I finally opened my eyes, and I was so overwhelmed by the declaration, I grabbed, I just put my hand on his head, and I said, Oliver, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Oliver looked at me, he said, what does that mean, Daddy? I said, when I look at you, I'm filled with awe of how God made you. I took his hand, I said, every one of your fingers and the way I see you on the playground and the way you climb trees, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, the way your mind works, the fact that you'd ask me that question. What does that mean, Daddy? It means you're full of wonder. He asked me, he said, is mommy fearfully and wonderfully made? I said, oh yeah. He says, uh, are you fearfully and wonderfully made, daddy? I said, yeah, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he said, um, <clears throat> is Lucy, his sister, is Emma fearfully and wonderfully made? I said, yeah, they're fearfully and wonderfully made too. He said, is Samuel fearfully and wonderfully made? He's 10 year old, older than him, 10 years older than him. Sam's 16 and, and Oliver's, you know, seven. So is Samuel fearfully and wonderfully made? I thought, yeah. I mean, look at your big brother. When you look at him, you don't think he's fearfully and wonderfully made? Oliver looked at me, he said, no, I'd never say that he's fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> and I said, I said, Oliver, what would you say? He said, I'd just say that he's got blue eyes and blonde hair and he's a whole lot bigger than me. And I sat there at that chair. The Lord brings me back to that memory of that morning. And Jesus said, that's why you love Bill Fay and Bethel. Why? Because it's the Psalms, you see. This is our worship. Oliver's so far ahead of me because he's behind me. Do you, you get that? I've arrived at the language, and he's doing it. I'd never say he's fearfully and wonderfully made. I'd just say he's got blue eyes, and he's got blonde hair, and he's a whole lot bigger than me. You see, the worship that God is after is you got blue eyes and blonde hair, and you're a whole lot bigger than me. It's not just that we declare it. It's that we're actively doing it. Oliver's actively doing it. He doesn't have language for it. I just told him what he's doing. That's important. Activity in our worship. It's not just about what we declare. It's that every time we say, I trust you, Jesus, there's a Jesus listening to that, saying, oh, really? promise tonight I, I want to just take some of these themes that we've been doing in our worship and just let a few things just work into us um, the passage I'm going to take you could take several actually this is a beautiful one Luke 22, verses 31 to 32. It's going to sound a bit like rough, but you'll see. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, 
Strengthen your brethren. What I love about this passage is it's slap dab in the middle of Simon Peter's journey. We sang this tonight, you're home to me, wild and free. What's destiny? I remember asking Eugene Peterson, what's destiny, Eugene? Destiny is when God, instead of just saying go farm the world, he lays out borders that your life will, you'll never reach the ends of, and he says, go farm that field. There's a freedom that we have, but as you know, if you raise children, my kids don't just want endless freedom. Sometimes heaven disturbs my little kids because they just think forever. They just can't even get their heads wrapped around it. It's just so much when there's boundaries that our hearts and our lives will never reach. I love to sing about finding God. I sing about it in lots of my songs, but ultimately, we don't find God. Not, that's not how it really works. God finds us. So who do we find? Well, we find ourselves eventually Hopefully. And when we do, we find the one who found us and loved us long before we could find and love ourselves. Jesus is present to places in you and me that we're not even yet present to ourselves. Jesus is so present. Jesus is present to places in you and me that we're not even yet present to ourselves. Peter was always arguing with Jesus. He's arguing with Jesus here. I'm not ever going to deny you, Jesus. Jesus is present to places in you and me that we're not even yet present to ourselves. I uh, had the opportunity to go to a silent retreat and listen to a blind Jesuit pre priest preach. I've been many times to see this guy, Father Larry Gillick. I, I, he doesn't have a book out or anything like that. He's just amazing. And Father Gillick, he's blind. I say he's blind because I really, there are some things that only the blind can see. When you listen to Father Larry Gillick, it's like, it's, it's as if he wakes up every morning and never misses a sunrise and, and goes to bed right after every sunset. And he sees them all. He never misses a, a leaf changing color. Never misses the movements of seasons. And it seems, you know, it's like he can hear better than most of us too. Maybe because he is blind. Maybe because he spent so much time in silence. I don't know. But he can hear. <clears throat> I remember one time I was listening to him speak, and he said, this morning I was giggling to myself listening to a goose singing. And a goose sounds pretty amazing if you're a goose. I thought that was hilarious. He said, a goose doesn't sound like an oriole. I didn't even know what an oriole sounded like. <laughs> I thought, this guy listens. Goose doesn't sound like an Oreo. Goose doesn't sound like a robin. And that's the beauty of it. Because beauty is distinguished by its peculiarity. Jesus is present to things in you that you are even embarrassed by. The beauty of your life may be very well the thing that you feel is the weakness of your life. Or maybe the way to say it is the strength of your life may very well be the thing that you think is the weakness of your life. Jesus is present to places in us that we are not even present to ourselves. Hmm. 
Herzen. I remember he said this to us one time. He says, some of you in this room, he's, you know, he's blind. He says, some of you in this room, you think that God disapproves of you. He says, God doesn't disapprove of you. Write that down, I remember him telling us. So I wrote it down. And I liked that word. Because that word was something that I feel like I've preached, I've said, you know what I mean? We tend to like those prophetic words that we've heard before. It's the strange words that sometimes, you know what I mean? <laughs> we, we don't have ears for. He said, and some of you in this room, you think that God approves of you. But God doesn't approve of you either. Write that down. Uh, God doesn't approve of me either. Question mark. You know what I mean? Because he's, he's almost 80, so he's got to know what he's talking about. <laughs> I'll just like leave it there. It's way better than that, he said. Some, some of us think God's a press. He's like a machine that doesn't even care about the creation, just forward. Some of you want God to be a machine, just forging your lives into their shape. Like only a blind man can do. But God, he's a press. He's not a press, he's a potter. That's what he said. He said, I, I like to do pottery, he told us. I get that pottery on the wheel and... And I shape and form it, even I reverence its resistance and use it to shape and form it. We are shaped and formed by the very hands of God. He's not a press and a machine that couldn't care for his creation. God's a potter who knows you by your name. Shaped and formed by the hands of a living God. He reverences even your resistance. Even the life of Jonah, even when we run, he's using the running in shaping and forming. And I remember he said this, he said, you cannot get off the wheel of God. You are becoming. Even in your running, you're becoming. It's a holy thing to be. We are shaped and formed by the hands of God. No height nor depth can separate us. The greater the distance, the greater the love. It's a holy thing to be wild and free. Jesus, shape us. Form us. It's way better than, this is the way we, we live. It's the shame game. Just raise your hands like this. We just declare right now, break off generations and generations of shame. It's like, the, I just keep saying that word, shame. Being even ashamed of the very beauty of God in you. We break it off in Jesus' name. Thank you, God, that our peculiarity distinguishes our beauty. In Jesus' name. We're shaped informed by the hands of God we're held long before we can hold on we're loved long before we even know how to love aren't we 
We're found by God, by Jesus, long before we can find him. And like Jonah, even when we run from our calling, we most often will end up running right into it. I took my daughter Emma on a Bible study, um, and I, I thought I'd just memorize the story of there in Milwaukee where we live, and I thought I'd memorize the story of Adam and Eve. Just the beginning when they were created. So I memorized it so it wouldn't be like, you know, boring. I, I usually don't read my notes. I like to do things from memory. I'm reading my notes tonight because I got up at 2.30 in the morning. So, uh, but, but I tried to memorize it and I just began to share with her about how Adam and Eve were created. And all of a sudden she looked at me with her eyes. She was eating a pancake. She looked at me and she said, Daddy, don't you think this story is a sad story? I said, huh? I mean, I thought immediately in my mind, I thought she was thinking of Sunday school or something, thinking about the apple and all that stuff, right? I said, well, I don't think this part is that sad. She said, well, I think it's sad. I said, well, why do you think it's sad? She was nine. She has pancake coming out of her mouth. She says, I think it's sad because... I mean, you're telling me they never got to be kids. They just had to start out as adults. <laughs> I thought, who's taking who on a Bible study? <laughs> it's interesting. out later on in life that Saint Arrhenius depicted Adam and Eve as infants for several reasons, not the least of which was their need to grow into being fully human rather than just starting out perfect. And Gregory of Nyssa, a fairly important father of the faith, is actually famous for saying this, sin happens whenever we refuse to keep growing. I don't know if any of you saw the film The Walk about this crazy guy that decided he wanted to walk across the Twin Towers on a wire. There was a documentary first and they put it into a movie. I mean, he decides he has his dream, like many of us do, to do something, but he doesn't know how to do the small thing. He doesn't even know how to walk across the wire, but he wants to walk across the Twin Towers. That's like something. Else. So Papa Rudy is the guy that's training him, and he gets a bit arrogant early on, and he, he, he and falls, and he's hanging, and Papa Rudy says, most wire walkers die when they think they've arrived. Falling, failing, running. That's not our enemy. The greatest enemy of your life is not failing or falling or messing up. The greatest enemy of our lives is a rival. Not continuing to grow. One of the first songs I ever wrote was this song and declared it over people was freedom. Freedom to dance, freedom to sing, freedom to grow. I'm telling you, Pharaoh, let God's people go. The empire always wants to stifle growth. The enemy of your life is not your failure or your falling. Falling is just learning to stand. Death is a doorway. Falling is just learning to stand. Right? This is what Jesus teaches. This, this is the kingdom message. Death is a doorway. Who says that? Kingdom people say that. Falling is learning to stand. That's not just... We're not just talking in imagination world. We're not talking. 
Faith is not make-believe. Faith is, is seeing reality as it is. Faith is a baby in a mother's womb. It's kicking at you and giving you something, but you can't see it. Faith isn't, faith isn't making reality up. Faith is not ignoring a reality that exists that isn't so easily seen. Growth is an essential part of living. Even the universe grows. Most scientists believe that the universe will continue to expand for as long as eternity. And when God wanted to show us what he was like, he came as a baby and he grew into a man. I love to tell my children, yeah, I, right? Oliver, my older ones think it's a little bit funny. Samuel, he turned 16 this year. Jesus was 16 once. Emma, you're 14 year this year. Jesus knows exactly what it feels like to be 14. Lucy, you're 10. You just turned 10 in June. Lucy, I say at her birthday, Jesus knows exactly what it feels like to be 10. Oliver, Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be seven. A seven-year-old boy. He learned how to learn and listen and mimic and talk and walk and obey and fail and fall and lose. Jesus taught us how to lose. Jesus told us we would lose. Jesus taught us how to lose. And Jesus told us we would lose. Jesus finds Peter right at the beginning. He's not catching any fish. And they've been fishing all night. They haven't caught a thing. And Jesus needs a place to preach. So he goes into that boat and he goes out and borrows Peter's boat and goes out and preaches to the people. When he finishes, it's as if he's saying thank you to Peter he, or Simon at the time. He says, Simon. Why don't you cast your nets on the other side? They cast the nets on the other side. They bring in such a haul of fish, it's breaking the nets. Simon says, Lord, Lord, get away from me. Jesus not only does not get away from him, he says, why don't you come be with me? Why don't you come follow me? Then all of a sudden, you end up at the end of the whole story, John 21. They're out casting their nets, and they're not catching any fish again. Peter can't even recognize Jesus' voice, which isn't too far from a lot of us. We, we often, when we feel shame and condemnation, we can't recognize Jesus' voice. Could be speaking to us right through our children, right in the morning. We can't even recognize it anymore. John the Beloved recognizes Jesus' voice. Says, hey Peter, that's Jesus. Peter does not walk on the water. I love that about John 21. He does not walk on the water. He jumps in the water. And he swims to shore to be with Jesus. It's even better than that, guys. You want to talk about the circle of God and what Jesus does in story. And how careful God is in shaping and forming our lives. 
he, he sets up a campfire on the seashore. There's only two campfires or coal fires in, in the Bible where, where, where Peter denies Jesus and where Jesus reinstates him. That's not just coincidence. Jesus is setting up, right? Even the smell is going to remind him of the denial. And there he is as if it, everything's okay again. Hey, I mean, why don't you cast your nets on the other side? Who even knows how long this was? How, how many nights and how many days Peter was held and felt the shame of what he had done, that he had denied Jesus. And there Jesus is. He reinstates Peter. Do you love me? The whole thing. You know what happens. There he is soaking wet. And, and Jesus declares over Peter, feed my sheep. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have returned to me, you're going to strengthen your brothers. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Oh, no, Jesus, I'm not going to deny you. There's no way I'm going to deny you. I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to fall. No, 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 I'm not going to do that. Jesus. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you have returned to me, you will strengthen your brothers. Now, most of the editors of Scripture, which I think editors are wonderful, but most of the editors of Scripture have edited scripture to say this above this passage and Jesus predicts Peter's denial I think that's a lot we love that I think we love that in church we love statements like that and in some ways I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you it is Jesus predicting Peter's denial that's like one way you could look at it but it's way more than that Jesus is predicting Peter's return. Simon, Simon, <laughs> Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail, and when you have returned to me, you will strengthen your brothers. How's I was with Lucy, she was learning her cursive, and she learned the word love. She was learning the word love this one day, how to write it in cursive, she still learns it. So she's writing it and writing it and writing it on those sheets where you write it and write it and write it. So she's writing it and writing it and I'm reading the Bible or something. And I'm, I'm sitting there in, in the coffee shop and she's writing that and love, 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 love. All of a sudden she looks up at me, she's about six at the time, she looks up at me she says, Daddy, look, love's got a hole in it. I thought, love's got a hole in it. It's like a country song or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I thought, love's got a hole in it. And the more I thought about that, the more I saw that hole became a circle. Love tells the whole story. Love lets us journey far from Eden and find our way back home again. Love says, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail, and when you have returned to me, you're going to strengthen your brothers. The worship of our life is the story of our life. The beauty of our life, what Jesus is shaping and forming out of our lives. This is the thing. I wish that we could make this like a waterway and you could stand, you know, in the boat 
and you could hear Jesus call your name tonight and you could jump in the water and swim to shore and have him reinstate you on this stage. Some of us bound by shame, we've just even lost the ability to hear Jesus' voice anymore. As if our life isn't a journey, as if God has stopped shaping and forming us. And honestly, we live in a world where we call ourselves a family of God. But part of this kingdom movement of family is being a family. And part of being a family is saying, you're running right now, but I've prayed for you. I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail. I want you to ask yourself how many times you pray, how many times you edit people's lives with what they're doing or what Jesus is doing or saying. You see what I'm saying? How many times do you edit people's lives with, oh, oh yeah, they're failing, or Predicting people's return. Jesus, save us from judgment without the heart and the passion of Jesus. Set us free from the lack of faith that's in us. Awake to our own words, our own prophetic words. What about your children? What about your husbands? What about your spouses? What about people in the church? What about people? I mean, I've, I'm 43. I'm just 43. And only being 43, and I'm looking at many of you that are older than me, I'm only 43, and I've already lived a lifetime of having people tell me they're my brother, and then I never hear from them again. Eugene Peterson's famous for saying this. Everybody has issues with the church, but can you imagine a world without her? Where else do we get to come and actually live out this work of family? Where else do we get to see people journey far from Eden and come back home? Where else do we get to stay put long enough to actually watch people journey far from Eden and find their way back home again? We're shaped and formed by the hand of God. Boy, oh boy, if I had to learn that myself. You know how many times I've been, I've been told, you're a genius and you're anointed. I don't understand anything you're talking about. You're amazing and you're anointed. Wow. And sometimes people don't even say anything. They just never talk to you for years and years and years. And just a few years ago, you were the love of their life. But about six or seven years ago, I just decided, I'm not going to be upset about that. I'm just not going to be that. I don't want to be that. This is not what Jesus has called us as a kingdom people to. To declare our words over people of what we think. What do you think, Jesus? What do you think over our children? I'm going to share this just really briefly. I went to see a, 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 a priest, which sounds like the beginning of a joke. But it's not. And it, I went to go see a priest. I went in, and the reason I went to go see him is because I was having a struggle because I knew he'd have a clear mind and because I'm not Catholic. And I thought, wow, I need to go talk to this guy. He's a different kind of follower of Jesus than I am. He has a completely different journey. I want to listen to what he has to say. So I said to I started telling him, man, it seems like the closer I get, the more I read the Gospels and the more I read about Jesus and the more I go after Jesus. This is about five years ago, six years ago as I was journeying. The more I feel people don't really want that. And I, I, I asked him, I said, uh, I 
is that supposed to be painful? Is that, is that a process? He said, oh yeah. He said, yeah. He said, people just don't know what to do with a living Jesus present in other people's lives, working. We just don't know what to do with that, so we want to control it. I mean, he, and, and this, is, this is a huge kingdom statement for a Catholic priest to say this. I mean, the Catholic Church may be the worst at this, Jason. We've done it for years to people. I had a man that came in here. I've been ministering to him for 42 years, giving him spiritual direction. He walked in here the other day, and he said to me, he, he was crying, and he said, I can't say his name, Father so-and-so, my son has lost his faith. Now, this is a very, what I'm about to, he's, my son has lost his faith. He said, Jason, it took me 15 minutes of dialogue with this man to realize that his son had just become a Methodist. It's funny if you're not Catholic. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I, I know some of my Catholic friends are watching, but listen, they think it's funny too. It's funny, and he thought it was funny. He says, I'm not going to pray for your son as if he's lost his faith. Your son has not lost his faith. He's just lost your faith. And now... He's going to find his own. Jesus is with him. That's, that's just where I want to leave it tonight. And then I'm going to sing a song over us. Uh, If you want to let go of that shame, you want to let go of the judgment. And that model, I mean, what about your children? You see, if we live in a world that we try to make it as if people have lost their faith, but they just become a Methodist. They're just a little different than we are. I'm talking about Jesus followers, guys, out there. I'm not talking, I'm just talking about, let's just talk about Jesus followers. And somebody's just a little different than you. Maybe they read their prayers instead of recite them from a napkin like I would, you know, or, you know, maybe they, uh, Thank you for what you're making us, Lord, in the earth today. You're shaping and forming us by the power of your spirit. You're giving us confidence and prayer and a life that can... Speak the word of faith over people believe for our sons and daughters pray watch the whole cycle and even right now in 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 this room for those who've been left we're going to sing this song in a moment but we pray for the ability to forgive not because people deserve it, but because we want to be able to see again. Don't you want to be able to see again? And, and there's some in this room that you're the one that, and I'm not talking about, you know, being arrogant and being proud. I'm just talking, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about you, 
you truly are pursuing Jesus and because people don't understand you and don't, can't peg you, you feel homeless. And for you, I, I ask you for forgiveness. I wanted to write a song on forgiveness because honestly what we see with Jesus is not just forgiveness but this incredible faith, this declaration of hope over Simon and, and Peter and really over the church. And um, yeah, sing this song over you. Just receive it as you, as you will. part of the journey saying goodbye to who I thought I was life is a mystery full of twists and turns one little lesson that I've learned forgive our healing medicine forgiveness when we just can't forgive sharper than any sin stronger than any war it's not easy but I know it's a gift from I know it's a gift from yeah, it is. We roll apart of a family. Families growing again. And we will fall.
mountains But how much faith will it take to Let go of the pain we're in Reach out to the world again And keep holding on to you Forgive Our healing medicine When we just can't forget Sharper than any sword Stronger than any war It's not easy But no Could you just stand with me and uh, let's just take this, this song we were doing earlier and just want to just revisit it together um, and just ask the Lord for that. Um, it's a holy thing to be wild and free. Like a raging storm on the calm sea. Lord, heal my heart until my heart believes. It's a holy thing to be wild and free. Yeah, it is.
is a sacred space to be lost in wonder, to safely rest in the mystery. Lord, fill my heart until it's full of wonder. It's a holy thing to be wise. Did you get it? So what will happen next is uh, we'll say a blessing and we'll be finished. And then you'll be the body of Christ to one another. Well, you'll minister to one another. And um, what you have to learn to do sometimes, is what, what, what's hard for charismatics is like we need directions. The reality is when, when the Spirit breathes on you, you just breathe it back. You just take it right then. When it comes, you just take it. So some of you are going out of here forgiven, consciously forgiven. Some are going out consciously forgiving, intentionally forgiving. Um, some are leaving shame leaving it behind leaving shame some of you have found the hole in love and made the circle home so welcome home and you need to tell somebody I found my way home it'll do you some good and it'll help them 
It'll encourage them. But let's let everybody go home wild and free. <laughs> the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is yours now and every day and always and forever. Amen. God bless you, church.